Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listeners. Thanks to everyone, all of you, including Mike Cortez, Erwin Sturr, Ken Hayes, and David Jones. On this episode of DTNS, Google AI overviews tell publishers they can die today or die another day, maybe not so far into the future. Converting brain signals into speech reaches farther with a promising new study. And back to the office. Is it really helping tech companies? Depends who you ask. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, August 15th, 2024. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And we've got a cornucopia of tech news to get through today. Justin, I hope you're buckled in. Uh, uh, I have it uh, double buckled, and I'm showing the flight attendant as they walk by so they don't yell at me on takeoff. Excellent, excellent. You've come prepared. Uh, and with that, let's start with the quick hits. The Financial Times sources say SoftBank is shifting focus away from working with Intel to build AI processors for its Project Izanagi initiative due to volume and speed issues, potential ones with Intel. Instead, SoftBank is said to be in discussions with TSMC on chips designed to rival NVIDIA's AI GPUs in performance. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission finalized new rules in its ongoing crackdown of fake reviews, including fake customer and celebrity testimonials on websites and e-commerce platforms. The FTC's rules, which passed with a 5-0 vote, prohibit the buying and selling of phony reviews and product testimonials, effective in 60 days. The formal ban includes stiff penalties for violators, with fines reaching as high as 50 thousand dollars per violation that's a lot of money it's a lot of money i'd like to see how this is enforced you know yeah sometimes fake hey, reviews are so fake that you just this is, this is actually bogus. helpful right Pro- mm-hmm. prove that camilla in connecticut exists i dare you <laughs> right yeah Google's Threat Analysis Group, or TAG as it's known, said Wednesday it disrupted Iran-sponsored efforts to attack campaigns of both President Biden and President Trump. TAG, which focuses on combating government-backed attackers, said it detected a steady pattern, small but steady, of phishing attempts from the Iranian APT42 hacking group to get into email accounts of senior campaign officials on both sides and was able to block them. The phishing tactics included impersonating think tanks like the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and the Brookings Institution. Mm, Very, very interesting follow-up to a story we covered on Monday. Chinese car maker Zeker claims its latest EV batteries can be charged from 10% to 80% capacity in, wait for it, friends, 10 and a half minutes using its ultra-fast charging stations. This speed beats Zeker's rivals, including Tesla and BYD. Zeker's new battery also performs well in cold temperatures, charging from 10 to 80% of its capacity in less than a half an hour in temperatures as low as negative 10 degrees Celsius. Ooh, that's Ze- chilly. I know. Zeker's 2025 007 sedan will be its first vehicle to have <laughs> the new battery, and that's available next week. I know many of you who live in colder climates than me say 10 below Celsius is nothing, Sarah. I know. Still, it's freezing. Still. Yeah. California Governor Gavin Newsom announced the state's driver's licenses and ID cards will be accessible through Apple Wallet or Google Wallet in the coming months. These can be used for ID verification at select businesses and TSA checkpoints for now at select airports. But you still need to carry your physical ID card. That's required by law. 500,000 people have already added a driver's license or ID to the California DMV Wallet app, which I didn't even know existed, so I should do that when we're done with the show. The pilot program (laughs) launched last year and is capped at 1.5 million participants. So Google's AI overviews, those are the generated summaries that you see at the top of search results for some searches, not all searches. They show up before the linked results that you're used to seeing in Google searches. Uh, They launched to all U.S. users back in May. There was a test that Google had been doing for a while, so U.S. users got this. Um, I've become very used to them at this point. Now Google's expanding uh, with local language support to Brazil, India, Indonesia, Japan, Mexico, 
and the UK. The company's doing uh, a little moving around of UI. The carousel of the source material, they kind of look like a carousel of cards that go below that that summary, um, are moving to the right-hand column. You'll see page name, a description. You see that now, but it's designed to give you more visible other details. Uh, on the mobile experience, it'll be a row of icons in the top right corner that you can expand. So working in exactly the same way. Google's also testing inline links into the summary itself, something that Bing and OpenAI are already doing. So if you see something, within that summary, you don't have to go hunting through the carousel to be like, where do you think they got that information from? So that's kind of interesting. Uh, additionally, Google is testing the ability to save an AI overview. So it comes up if you do that search again, and it's meant to simplify the overviews language. I actually tried this out uh, because I wanted to see like, what? how would it simplify the language and come up if I search it again? If I searched it once, wouldn't I have gotten the information? So I did a search for what is the topography of Sudan? And, you know, I got a couple paragraphs of, you know, arid climate, some mountains to the to the south, um, you know, just kind of general stuff. And so I saved it. And what's kind of neat is that you can then, if you're saving a variety of AI overviews, you've got a saved page. It's almost like a bookmarked page, but it shows up as like square tiles. But then I went, okay, let me go back to Google search. And I said, what does, what was my second, what, what was the wording of my second one? What's the general landscape of Sudan? So topography, general landscape, you know, basically the same question, but, you know, asked a little bit differently. And I got the same uh, summary. However, it was slightly shorter. Mm. So, you know, when I started, I'm like, oh, it's exactly the same. But I looked at them and I was like, it's, it's slightly, you know, brevityized. Uh, I don't know exactly what Google's going for here, but it's, it's, you know, with this expansion, Justin, Google's obviously taking this seriously. I have found AI overviews to be in general, pretty helpful. Um, mm -hmm. anytime I'm, you know, if you're asking like it about some sort of, you know, like drug interactions or something where it's like, you really need to understand, you know, where your sources are coming from. I tend to kind of glaze over it and go, let me go straight to the Cleveland clinic or, you know, something like that. But uh, what are your what are your thoughts on AI overviews at this point? Well, I, I believe that they are helpful. I do think that on many levels they are probably the future of search, or at least what we want from search, because it does get us closer to our goal faster. I want to ask a question: How quickly do I have to get an answer? And the way that that used to work, a search engine finding a mess of links that is then going to give us the ability to learn it for ourselves has become complicated for the reasons that we are going to get into in a couple seconds. That being said, Google has really tried to lean into this even before the large language model boom. They were serving you the quick answer to your query faster, which then took away the need to click on a link. But for example, mm -hmm. if you just ask, hey, what's the most points that's ever been scored in a basketball game? The answer would show up right there at the top as opposed to having you click a link that was to a blog post that answered that question. This is the, the, the simple next level of it. There are a lot of uh, competitors in this game now. The question that I would have about for Google is how do you monetize it? Are there right. ad words that make sense to be put around a product like this? Okay, so, right. This kind of leads us into the second part of the story. Uh, not everyone is into AI overviews, not because they don't work well, maybe because they work a little bit too well. If you are a site owner and you want Justin or me or, you know, anybody to click on your link and you don't want uh, AI overviews to summarize what you might have put a lot of work into uh, on your own website, you might be in a little bit of a pickle because Google uses the same crawler, it's known as Googlebot, that keeps track of web pages for search results, but it also uses that for AI overviews. So you could block the crawler that effectively keeps you from being discovered online, pretty good way to bury yourself for all eternity, but allowing AI summaries is designed, I mean, in theory, it's a tool designed to need you as the publisher less. Now, I think the idea of inline linking, um, which is, it's going to work better depending on what the query is and what the, you know, the, the, the summary that you get back is, that might 
help out publishers, at least in the interim, in some way. I don't know if there's a world where a publisher, if they offer the same kind of information that would be part of a summary as 10 other websites, if they were to pay to be the website that is linked in that in that inline part of the summary. I mean, there are some options here, but I think in general, I, I empathize with publishers saying, well, this sucks. We have two really bad choices. It's just that one is worse than the other one. It's a bunch of people that are complaining that their train has left the station about 10 years after their train left the station, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. the, the reason why the Google experience has partly gotten worse is that the web has gotten worse and they have gotten worse in terms of sharing information in a clear and concise way because there used to be a time when the vast majority of people who were searching the internet were going to websites, at which point your customer was the actual viewer. In our modern world, nobody goes to a website unless they're directed there by a search engine or they're linked there by a social media post, right? And even in that case, you're pretty much only dipping in for a second because we've become so reliant on the aggregation. Google now is doing something that is far beyond what they've done before, but we're already to a world where all of these websites have become twisted and evil for SEO purposes, because it's the only way that anybody will show up there and they can monetize the ads that are on their site. The most yeah. uh, common server of which is Google as well. Google runs websites and uh, uh, yeah, you can block people. You can block Google. You can block open AI from doing it, but I think they've kind of lost the war. Now they can cut off their nose to spite their face, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to happen eventually anyway. Right. Yeah. It's going to get darker before it gets lighter, I guess. I think it might get, I, I think that there was, there was an old uh, John McCain quote that, uh, you know, it's always darkest before it goes pitch black. <laughs> yeah. Winter is here. I don't know. Yeah. We could go on and on. But let's actually talk about something that is uh, this is good news uh, in the scientific community for sure. The New England Journal of Medicine uh, has published details about a brain computer interface known as BCI developed by scientists over at the University of California, Davis, UC Davis, that can translate brain signals into speech really accurately. 97% claims the scientists. They're also claiming that's the highest success rate to date by anybody. This type of BCI is called a speech neuroprosthesis. So here's what happens. A device that's used in this uh, it, for this uses a four micro electrode array utilizing four, uh, 256 cortical electrodes implanted in the left precentral gyrus. That is a part of your brain associated with speech coordination. Normally, signals pass through here, and then they move muscles that allow you to speak. The experiment sent signals to a computer, then used that data to train a model to decode those signals into words. Then that model could decode the signals in real time and display the words on a screen. Then a text-to-speech engine, which were which was trained on the recordings of a patient's voice, somebody who had problems with speech, was trained to sound like that patient and then read the words. So it's as if your brain tells your muscles to tell your mouth and, you know, windpipes to say something, but it's actually circumventing everything after it leaves your brain. Now, very specifically, um, th this has been uh, tested uh, with, with really good results in a patient. In July of last year, so just over a year ago, neurosurge neurosurgeon at Dr. David Brandman implanted this device in Casey Harrell, 45-year-old who has ALS, also has a severe speech impediment. Harrell started communicating within minutes of using the system. Good, good news. In the first training session, uh, the test demonstrated 99.6% accuracy with a vocabulary of 50 words in 30 minutes. So limited vocabulary, but good results in a short amount of time. After continued training, it sustained 97.5% accuracy, so didn't fall much at all, over a period of 8.4 months, and Harold could conduct self-paced conversations at a rate of approximately 32 words per minute for more than 248 cumulative hours. 
not consecutive, but um, obviously uh, they were paying attention to what Harrell could do and progress over uh, quite a bit of time. Justin, I mean, there is no feel-good story like this when you're talking about large language models. I mean, all you model haters out there, got to love this. <laughs> well, I, I, I do. Number one, a great tech done good story. Uh, you, you, you love to be able to see technology circumvent some of the failings that our human body has, whether it be in a physical capacity or obviously in the far more tricky brain situation. And what I like about this as well is that it's – pretty clean. The only thing that I could think of that would be a drawback and without getting into shock jock territories, I hope there's an off button. And so you, you are able to, to differentiate between an inner monologue and something that you would like to have said out into right. the world by way of a speaker. In a serious note, I believe this is a great example of where large language models and AI in general, which we have seen uh, create or have a tremendous ap uh, uh, aptitude to just reduce busy work, reduce uh, uh, tasks that are literally guessing the next word that should be said so you can put together something. Uh, you can do that a lot faster. And we're, we're in a moment of kind of pessimism in, in, in the world of AI, at least in the investment of AI. I don't, I still don't feel like we've wrapped our head around what a quantum leap forward that is. It is, the shortening of a process that is we're still rapidly finding the end of. And when you see the results in technology like this and where this can go, if this works, how much better can it get when you already have the important part, the recognition of the signals in the brain, if we're already at 99.7%, how much better can get, can that get? How much better can these voices get? How much better right. can, the experience get, uh, and, and then from there, how does the brain of the person that's working with it uh, become more adapt to it? Uh, it's really profound. It, it is something that at both the high end and the low end is truly extraordinary. And, you know, the, we, we've, we, not me personally, uh, cause you wouldn't want me uh, doing any research of, of this caliber, but um, we, we are getting to these, you know, we, Getting to the point in a variety of studies where it's like, okay, merely thinking something, you know, even if you're not thinking something that looks like a physical sentence in your brain, it's like you think things to reach your arm out. You think you think things to, you know, scratch a mosquito bite. You 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 know, everything starts in the brain, even if it feels like it's you know just muscle memory type thing, and to have something that is just this much more of a practical use for, for example, Casey Harrell, you know, has a hard time speaking. Well, this, uh, you know, being able to get thoughts, um, into a computer where his thoughts can be displayed. That's, I mean, that's, you know, it's, it feels like magic to be able to then be able to call somebody. <laughs> I'm using like the phone, you know, as if, you know, mm -hmm. we all just like pick up a rotary phone and call each other anymore, but to be able to speak in a voice that's very similar to how he would be talking if he was, if he was uh, able to talk on his own, you know, to somebody at a call center or a relative yeah. or, you know, you know, and that's not, it doesn't have to be over the phone. It can be in person too. You know, you got a speaker. It's like, okay, you're talking. sounds like you. That is, I mean, it, it's, I mean, <sighs> I don't even know how to describe how much that would transform someone's life. Yeah, I agree. I 100% agree. Well, I think we can also agree that we love everyone in our Discord. You can join right. our conversation in our Discord. It's going on 24-7. We have all sorts of categories. People love chatting about, yeah, you know, hardware, software, stuff we're talking about on the show, sometimes just fun memes and pets. Join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, Justin. Let's talk Eric Schmidt, shall we? Let's Eric Schmidt, of course, Schmidt it up. Of course, former C uh, CEO of Google and executive chairman, walked back some comments that he made about work-life balance and remote work policies. Uh, his stance in these comments was that Google thought more about these than winning against startups where people, quote, work like hell. 
Now, in an email to the Wall Street Journal, Schmidt said, I misspoke about Google and their work hours. I regret my error. What was the error and what is the context, you may ask? Okay, so Schmidt uh, made these comments. He was uh, participating at, in a discussion at Stanford University. He criticized Google's remote, remote work policies, and that was in response to a question about Google competing with OpenAI, something that, you know, it, obviously Schmidt has some, some ideas about. Stanford posted the video of the conversation, including these comments, to YouTube, got a lot of views before Schmidt asked for the video to be taken down. Uh, you might think maybe he just didn't realize he was being recorded. Maybe he had second thoughts. Schmidt joins a long list of corporate leaders, JP Morgan Chase CEO, Jamie Dimon and Tesla CEO, Elon Musk, who have complained about work from home policies. So Schmidt isn't alone here, but Justin, do we think mm -hmm. that uh, him going after Google specifically saying, you know, all this stuff is just taken away from the workers doing what they're supposed to do best, killing those startups. I would say in terms of Google specific, I don't think that it's the rank and file Googler that is the problem for where Google is at right now. I think it is the leadership of Google. That is the reason why that, that, that they are at where they are at right now. So I would I would have a, a quibble with him there. The the larger question I think gets to this work from home thing, and with the full acknowledgement that you are listening to a podcast where both of the hosts are currently working from home, mm -hmm. I do think it's a little bit different because we were never in an office. Da Daily Tech News Show has been a work from home uh, enterprise from day one. Yep. But I don't know. I, I, it is, it is not my world to, to have worked in an office. Uh, I, we have benefited in this house from a work from home policy when my wife worked at Twitch. So I, I just kind of wonder where we are now in 2024 lockdown was in 2020 in the next five years. Are we going to look more like 2019 mm. or more like 2020? Like, like which, which direction are we going in? Because there still is a desire from certain sectors of the economy, bosses, Wall Street, to say, move people more in office. They work harder when they are in office. And I, I don't know, that clashes against my worldview, but also I don't run a business. Yeah, I feel, that's a good question. Yeah, do we go back to something just pre-pandemic? You know, is it just going to take a few more years, but that's what we're naturally going to go back to because that's what people were used to for so long before that? Or is there just no way to, to, to you know, unplug from the either full-on remote work or par at least part-time remote work just is better, uh, you know, for, you know, individuals, for families, for people who had long commutes before. I don't think there's a one size fit all solution here, um, at all, but I, I, I know a lot of folks who I, you know, a handful of people who I've talked to recently about how happy they are that they were able to go back to an office. They didn't feel like they, um, you know, kind of held their own feet to the fire enough or had too much autonomy or felt disconnected from their team having to be remote. I know a lot of parents feel this way about, you know, their kids that were in school. Uh, <laughs> you, you could equate a lot of businesses to like, do kids do well just, you know, working from home or should they go to a classroom? Um, so it's a little bit different. And when you're talking about a company like Google, huge campuses, multi campuses all over the world, you know, you know, many thousands of workers, um, I, I don't think that any company of that size can say responsibly, no, nah, no, nah, we should just go back to the way it was. Have you learned nothing over the last, you know, four plus years? Well, yeah, four plus years. Uh, that, that's just, there's, there's just no way. I mean, real estate alone, you could just save so much money by doing things differently, even if you just didn't care about your workers. I also think that, uh, you know, the the hybrid work thing where it was like, well, you still have to come to the office twice a week. Sometimes that rings really hollow to folks where it's like, ah, it's just like some quota thing because they want it yeah. to be fair. We all have to do it, but nobody really knows why. And you're not there at the same time because everybody's like, oh, they, I like having Mondays off. And someone else is like, well, I, I like having Thursdays off. So you're not really seeing your coworkers anyway. I think 
I think it's still pretty messy, but I, I think that it's a stupid reason for a company, especially a large big tech company to say, well, that's why startups are beating us because we're too focused on this stuff. It's like, I mean, are you? Are you really too focused? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, uh, Schmidt is somebody who has a habit of saying things in public that wind up haunting him. Let's not forget him saying that uh, if, if you have nothing to hide, then you shouldn't fear somebody seeing into some of your secrets, which uh, is, is when that was when he was CEO. <laughs> That's rich. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And it was somebody who he apparently had a few things that he would have liked to have kept hidden, uh, including this video, for the record, uh, which which he he has to be pulled down. My sense is that a lot of these questions are not going to be answered right now because we're still in the middle of a tech winter. Uh, Interest rates have yet to come down meaningfully, which means the money has yet to flow in the way that tech is used to it flowing. uh, And we can start taking, uh, you know, a lot more bets on a lot more things. Right now you're looking at high value areas and that's pretty much it. But when that happens, when the interest rates come down, when the money spigot starts flowing all over the valley and uh, various other places, I wonder whether or not it is an increased push in the way that Google itself got people to work for them, which was a perk rush to say, no, come into the office because we're going to make it worth your while. You have to come into the office to get a massage, right? You have to come into the office to get free meals. You have to come into the (laughs) office for childcare. That stuff is very, very important. And I wonder if that's going to be how this uh, gets back to where closer to where it was in 2019, which is to make it worth the while of the employees. Listen, I'll go anywhere. Uh, I will leave this home office tomorrow if I get a massage. Yeah, <laughs> you just tell me where to show up. I'll now do we it. know now we know we how to kidding. entrap Sarah Lane. That's that, that right. is, that I mean, the, the one size fits all Wiley Coyote trap for Sarah Lane is just a free massage here. I mean, if I have to pay for it, I'm not going anywhere. But free massage, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. free, you know, a free massage. I've got okay. my limits. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, let's move on to the mailbag. We've been talking about passkeys uh, this week. We first talked about passkeys on Tuesday's show. The fact that they were on the rise, um, and then we got an email uh, yesterday from somebody who said, "You know, I- I'm into passkeys. Doesn't really seem like." Any of the services I'm using utilize them, but, you know, I'll keep checking. We got a nice response from KV. KV is in sunny and gradually getting reasonably cooler-ish DC. Hi, KV. Says, in response to that email on passkeys, here's a couple useful directories that list services that support passkeys. Apologies if they've been shared before. I don't think they have, KV, so thanks for sending these along. Uh, First one is passkeys.directory. This was compiled by 1Password, which is a password manager. There's also a passkeys directory which was compiled by the fido alliance um so you see some of the same stuff there but um you got a couple choices and then even 2fa general two-factor information if you just want to refresh your on yeah, maybe i'm using a service and i don't have 2fa on because you should always turn it on if you can um comes from the two-factor auth group and that url is 2fa dot directory so KV says, hopefully your service is on those lists. Yeah, it's good to double check. Let's get past mm-hmm. keys a thing. Let's make past keys a thing. Let's go. Continue to be a Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Please uh, Justin, uh, Justin, what is your thing? At least when you're not with us on Daily Tech News Show. Well, Sarah, as the old torch song goes, Chicago is the town that won't let you down. And the reason why is because we're not wrong. My panel show with Jen Briney and Andrew Heaton is coming to the toddlin town, second city, city with the big shoulders, the city with too many nicknames. This Sunday, the 18th, you can get tickets for our show at the Greenhouse Theater Center right now. Just go to my Twitter, uh, x.com slash Justin R. Young. Pin tweet at the top is where you're going to get that link. And announced... On this very show, on Monday, special guest, Tom Merritt. He is no going to be there way. live oh and gosh. in person Star in Chicago. G- good Lord. You, you, know, you know what it takes to get a diehard St. Louis Cardinals fan into to the belly of the beast of Chicago? This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Go <laughs> Free massage, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, get tickets. We'll be there Sunday. It should be an amazing crowd. And uh, we will see you this Sunday for We're Not Wrong. 
Excellent. Well, it's been a big week for the Android Faithful team. They've been busy covering all those announcements from Made by Google. Ron Richards, Huen Hui Duao, Michelle Ramon, and Jason Howell bring you the latest Android news and information every week. You should check it out. Watch live on Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific at youtube.com slash daily tech news show and subscribe to their feed at androidfaithful.com. Patrons, stick around for the extended show. Good day, Internet. I've got a question for you. Uh, muse on this for a few. How many gaming consoles can you hook up to a single TV before somebody gives you an award? We actually have that answer. <laughs> but just a reminder, you can catch our show. We are live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern at 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow, talking about businesses that can be more resilient to things like crowd strike events with Steve Zalowski. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand diamond club hopes you have enjoyed this program <laughs>